Hi, um, you're probably wondering why this video exists, and that's because it is a media vlog due in part to the fact that my computer had to uh, unfortunately go through a factory reset. Um, yeah, that's a little bit frustrating, and it's been a big ass nightmare, and I really can't do anything about it. I'm really disappointed. Uh, I'm really frustrated, but it, it is what it is, and I have just had to suck it up and just re redo a lot of things that have essentially been lost. Uh, that means videos that I was currently working on are gone, like the Pokemon Platinum Nuzlocke, uh, which I'm really frustrated about because I was actually putting some time into that. Um, also, the Pokemon White Hardcore Nuzlocke is gone, which I'm even more frustrated about because this is going to be the third time I've had to restart this entire Nuzlocke, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm just going to have to redo it, and um, I can get through it. I can do it again, but if there was anything I was feeling right now, it's a lot of spite towards my computer to the point where if I could necessarily fist fight my computer in the parking lot of an Applebee's, I would, and then I would throw myself into a wood chipper. However, that's not necessarily something I can do, so I can do the next best thing and do this media vlog, and um, hopefully y'all enjoy it. Uh, I guess I can talk about some of the stuff I've been watching, some of the stuff I've been playing, as well as some of the stuff I've gotten as of late. So I figured this would be pretty fun, and I've actually been wanting to do one of these for a while, so um, let's do it. Let's go through some of the stuff I've uh, recently acquired and just see how this all goes. Um, yeah. So, um, first off, I wanted to show off uh, some of the vinyls I've gotten as of late. So the first one is going to be the Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the video game uh, vinyl. I was really excited to get this. This um, took me a while to get because uh, limited run games uh, takes forever on their entire uh, shipping and such. But finally got it just recently, and oh boy, it has been a nightmare just waiting for this. But it's here, and I'm happy. And I'm excited because if I ever had to wait another day for this, I probably would have just gone insane. So, yay for that. Disappearing and coming right back. Uh, next up, I've got the uh, Johto Legends vinyl. Uh, this was a little hard to find, but I was really uh, excited for it. Um, I'm not necessarily a big Gen 2 fan, but I do like the music. Um, especially for a Krutiak uh, city. So, this was really nice. Um... I'm just not necessarily a big GSC fan, but then again, who is? Um, yeah, this is pretty nice. I'm really happy to have this. It's cool. And next, we have the Silent Hill 3 vinyl. Um, I really like Silent Hill music, especially 2, 3, and 4. Um, I'm going to be talking about Silent Hill a little bit later because I've been playing uh, some more Silent Hill. Uh, which one specifically, you'll have to find out. Um, but yeah, I like Silent Hill 3 a lot, and um, if we turn the back, we get a nice picture there of a Gillespie. Um, I believe it's Claudia, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a long time since I played Silent Hill 3. Then again, I just did a stream of it a while back, so I might just be going um, and uh, misremembering a lot of things as of late. But hey! I really like this. Um, You're Not Here is a pretty good intro title track, so I'm really happy. Finally, I got uh, Lucy Dacus's, um home video on vinyl. Really excited about this. Uh, I pre-ordered it and got it old just recently, so eh, it's pretty nice. I am really happy I got this. For movies, um, I ended up just getting everything everywhere all at once on... Blu-ray, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, um, because, um, everybody's talked about it, and why not add another person to the pile, um, but this is my, this has been one of my favorite movies, and, uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail as a little overview whenever I get there. Uh, finally, for some video games, saving the best for last over here, um, I ended up getting Metal Gear Solid, the GSC edition, or the, not the GSC, it's not Pokemon, uh, Metal Gear Solid Game Boy Color. Um, this is an interesting game, because uh, it is not uh, a one-to-one -one port of Metal Gear Solid, obviously, but it definitely is an interesting um, an interesting romp nonetheless, um, so yeah, this is nice. I'm going to try and stream it eventually, 
uh, it's been a really, really fun and interesting playthrough. Um, I just need to get the Game Boy Player all hooked up and such. Um, next up, I got the Capcom Fighting Collection. Really, really fun. Uh, if you like Dark Stalkers, who doesn't? Um, that's always a plus. Uh, also, I'm a big Puzzle Fighter fan. Um, I just anything that is essentially close enough to Tetris, I'm willing to throw some time into. And boy, boy howdy, am I willing to throw some time into that. Uh, this next one is actually a game I got because of a recommendation uh, from a YouTuber by the name of Narrow. Um, they do a Metroidvania uh, collection, and I ended up getting this as a result. Uh, Record of Lodos War, Deedlet, and Wonder Labyrinth. So, right here. Trying to get good lighting on the cover. Um, this is much more on the Castlevania side. Um, although I do like both Metroid and Castlevania. Um, I like Castlevania a little bit more, but uh, Metroid Dread definitely helped to uh, increase how much I actually do like the Metroid side, so it's probably about 50-50 at the moment. Uh, this next one, this next one's bad. Um, I ended up getting the uh, House of the Dead Limited Dead Edition. You can see it's got a little holograph on the front. Um, House of the Dead Remake, sort of awful. Um, unfortunately, uh, just gyro controls are not enough to necessarily save that game as much as I would hope they would have, but um, I guess the saving grace is that it's on PC, and if you can necessarily hook up a, a whole light gun rig to that, it sort of saves the game, but if you're playing on the Switch, and I imagine the PlayStation 4, uh, it's just not necessarily enough, but who knows, maybe they'll do a VR um, version and that ends up fixing it. Uh, and now finally, the best for last. Um, I ended up getting the Dot Hack collection, uh, the Dot Hack quadrilogy. Finally, all on, uh, all on disc. Um, this was hard to acquire. I'm just hitting my mic now, uh, but yeah, I finally got it. Um, all these games were hard. Well, obviously, Infection's pretty easy to find, but yeah, I got Infection, uh, Mutation, Outbreak. And finally, quarantine. Yeah, so I got all of that. Um, I want to stream this as well, uh, as well as with like Scars of, uh, Skies of Arcadia and uh, Thousand Year Door. Um, famous last words, obviously, but I would really like to play those on stream because I absolutely adore Infection and I haven't actually gotten to Disc 2. Um, so that'd be a really fun, interesting uh, stream whenever I can get to it. So we'll see how that goes. And. I hopefully I can get back to streaming soon uh, but anyways this should probably be everything I wanted to show so I just want to now sort of start talking about movies so I want to preface all of this by saying that every time I'm gonna be on camera I'm gonna be a little bit off the cuff and just try my best to not necessarily like stumble too much over everything I say but um, no promises but anyways Let's talk about some of the movies I ended up watching uh, as of late. And the first one I actually really wanted to talk about, which uh, is a bit older, uh, but I definitely wanted to get a chance to watch it. Uh, I ended up getting a Shutter account as a result. And the movie that I really want to talk about first is Demons, which was released in 1985 and was made by Dario Argento and Lamberto Bava, the son of Mario Bava, who is known for making Black Sunday. Um, I really wanted to see this movie because um, it sort of has a reputation for me ever since I was a kid. And um, if I could say anything about this film, it is truly a film that you could really see as proving the point that you don't really need to have any sort of substance when you are so full of style because your style is your substance and this is what i think makes this film so incredible and i'm going to talk about more of that right now i originally heard about demons when i was 13 as i watched bravo's 100 scariest movie moments listing demons at number 53. the story of demons is essentially an invocation of badness as the beginning is merely here to get our characters to the location of where all hell will break loose the Metropole. Once the horror begins though, there is no stop. 
Demons is essentially a 90 minute blood gushing skin tearing demon infested fever dream that goes from horror set piece to horror set piece. However, the effects are some of the best with so much that still holds up to this day that I was never bored by what I was watching. An infected cut produces boils that explode, a demon possessed woman ripping a man's throat out, and Tony the Pimp's incredible facial hair. If there were any criticisms I had about the movie, it would be that it just sort of ends, but as I said, this is a film that is all style with no need for additional substance. As a result, I can't help but give this movie a 3.5 out of 5. It's well worth your time to watch, and I highly recommend it if you're looking for some really gory horror films. I definitely wanted to reference Demons as well as Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments because Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments was definitely what got me to have an inclination towards horror, and if not necessarily seeing that, I would have never necessarily known about Demons, which would have never necessarily led me to all these years later finally watching it. And quite honestly, I love this film and just how completely off the rails it is, and I really do recommend it if you've never necessarily seen it, and yeah. I will definitely be talking about Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments, but getting to watch the moments of Viscera as this entire listicle show is having a person's neck get ripped open really does stay with you whenever you're uh, just home alone with a broken foot and not necessarily having any place to go. But yeah, <laughs> I will talk about Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments a little bit later in the list, but I, I want to sort of get to the next film before we get to that. So next film I wanted to talk about was X, which was directed by Ty West and was released in 2022. And if there's anything I could necessarily say with a title like X, you could definitely be sure that this is a film for the entire family. Just a good old film about a group of friends trying to make a porno as they get butchered one by one. Fun for the whole family. I saw a trailer for X and was immediately intrigued by what the plot could entail. The mystery of an elderly couple with a secret that conveys a sense of terrifying dread. A desolate farm located near a precarious swamp that evokes Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A group of promiscuous people with intent to make a pornographic film in hopes of making it big in a time where the only huge films of the genre were minimal. Think your Debbie Does Dallas or Deep Throat. As a result, I put X on my to be watch list and saw it during spring break and was immediately rewarded for my intrigue with an amazing slasher that had a lot of reverence for the genre as well as adding to it in its own way. The commentary on evangelical purity, sex, envy, and much more creates a slasher that is just as bloody as it is conscious about its subject matter. Also, incredible praise must be given to Mia Goth who plays dual roles and is able to capture a unique dichotomy between youthful and carefree sex appeal versus elderly spite and jealousy. One of my new favorite horror films, and I'm definitely recommending this. I'm giving it a 4 out of 5. X was a really fun surprise for me, uh, considering as much as I love A24 and as much as elevated horror can really put me off to the entire film Twitter out there. I absolutely adore this film and I really do enjoy a lot of what A24 has to put out. I think I could easily recommend this to anybody who is looking for a new horror film that they haven't necessarily seen. Uh, Mia Goth, is, as I said, is fantastic and I really look forward to her returning in Pearl, the prequel that they are making for X. Uh, if you haven't necessarily seen it, I do believe it's already streaming, so you could definitely just go ahead and rent it if you have the chance. So yeah, go out and see it if you haven't. It's awesome. Next up, I wanted to talk about a trilogy that I didn't even know really had these three films in sort of a trilogy of sorts. Uh, it's the Apocalypse Trilogy, which is a three film uh, series that I guess you could necessarily say have the entire themes of the world is ending or feels like it's going to end. Three films that were made by John Carpenter. Um, those are The Thing, which was made in 1982. Prince of Darkness, which was made in 1987, and finally, In the Mouth of Madness, which was made in 1994. I didn't really want to include this, but I hadn't necessarily ever seen Prince of Darkness or In the Mouth of Madness until recently, 
And really, I just couldn't help but really have this sort of, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares into you as I was watching these films. And it just sort of has this entire feeling that I couldn't necessarily put into words until I definitely started writing the script. So I want to sort of dive into a little bit of that right here and right now. The Apocalypse Trilogy was only recently made aware to me from John Carpenter fans who loosely tied these films together on the premise of their tone being stylistically very similar. Dark distilled dread with a sense of end of days approaching, each film in this trilogy has a profound sense of loss of quality of life. With a the thing, the loss of trust was replaced with paranoia, as a group of researchers begin to suspect each other of being an extraterrestrial life form determined to assimilate every last one of them. With Prince of Darkness, it is the loss of all that is believed inverted in on itself, with a group of scientists succumbing to an anti-god and now doing whatever they can just to survive. Finally, in the Mouth of Madness, a loss of reality as it shifts and contorts by beings beyond our own comprehension. Each of these films contains a sense of Carpenter's ethos, the end of everything sinking slowly in a world of mundanity. I love these films, with The Thing being my favorite horror film to this day. If I had to rate these films, In the Mouth of Madness and Prince of Darkness are definitely 4 out of 5s for me, and The Thing is John Carpenter's best film and will always be a 5 out of 5 every single time I watch it. I absolutely adore John Carpenter films. They were a big part of my entire childhood as well as just me growing up. I watched The Thing when I was in my teens and absolutely astonished by everything that I saw, just the entire creature design and all the special effects and the mood and setting just being absolutely dreadful. It's a movie I'll never necessarily forget, especially since it is my favorite horror film, but that's not to say I didn't enjoy In the Mouth of Madness or Prince of Darkness in any way, shape, or form as a lesser. I like both of them a lot, especially in the Mouth of Madness with its ability to set up this entire Lovecrafting and tale of monsters coming from the unknown to essentially bring upon the end of the world. I absolutely adore that film. And while Prince of Darkness is a little bit less grandiose in its entire scale, it still sets up such a really interesting small scale disaster that feels like, if left unchecked, will be a full-blown uh, catastrophe. I definitely recommend all three of these films, and if I can necessarily say any place to check them out, Shudder, I believe, still has In the Mouth of Madness and Prince of Darkness on their website, so go and check those out, and as I said, The Thing is still my favorite horror film of all time, and should be checked out immediately if you haven't necessarily seen it, and you love horror. So yeah. Uh, having said that, I guess my last final question is, do you read Sutter Kane? Okay, so this next film, I'm pretty sure you've heard me blab on and on about it on any of my social medias if you're following me there, and I am sorry about that, but this was just such an incredible film, and I absolutely adore it, and I am so sorry. I am going to reiterate that point because I went a little off the rails with how much I gushed about this film. However, I absolutely enjoyed it, and that film is Pig, which was directed by Michael Sarnowski, and it was released in 2021. I think there were some COVID complications as the film was coming out, but it ended up still being a fantastic film. And if there's anything else I can necessarily say, is that it is definitely the age of Cage, and we are all just living in it. Drink it in, man. I saw Pig on a recommendation after a few trailers piqued my interest in the same way that Nicolas Cage's more thoughtful performances have, tempering the energetic chaos he brings to most of his roles to create extremely memorable performances. Although the trailers have a bit of John Wick vibe to them, this film couldn't be farther from the revenge action genre. Pig is a somber journey focused on grief, loss, empathy, and pain that had me tearing up as the film neared its ending. The journey Nicolas Cage's character, Robin, takes is one that seeks to confront the past traumas of his former life after disregarding them for so long as he seeks to find his beloved truffle pig that was stolen from him. The film also has a 90 minute running time that allows for a very easy watch. As a result, this was my film of the year for 2021, and I highly recommend it. Last I checked, it was streaming on Hulu with a subscription. 
and I would say the price for admission is worth it. As a result, I can't go anywhere below a 5 out of 5 due to just how incredible this film was. I really, really do recommend watching it. Pig is a film that resonated with me very strongly. Its entire themes on grief and sorrow and loss really does resonate with me. It really does have this entire effect of being able to really resonate with that entire feeling of losing someone and never getting the chance to say enough of what you wanted to to them before they left and I don't know it's a film that really was a cathartic watch especially near the end I highly recommend it and it's only about 90 minutes long last I checked it was on Hulu and as I said this was my film of 2021 my film of the year and I can't necessarily recommend it enough, and I really, really say that you should go out of your way to watch this if you're looking to have that sort of catharsis, if you're dealing with that sort of grief and trying to figure out, or trying to move through it in a sense. Um, I love it. It's a damn good film. Um, which leads me to my current film of the year for 2022. I am really excited to talk about this because I actually made I was dead set on watching this whenever uh, I saw the trailers and thought to myself okay this looks completely off the rails and definitely up my alley and that film of course will be everything everywhere all at once which was released this year of 2022 and directed by the Daniels a duo both having the name Daniels and I did get a chance to watch Swiss Army Man before I actually saw this film. Um, I found Swiss Army Man to be very charming and uh, really, really up my alley as well. However, I do think that Everything Everywhere All at Once is a much more solid film and it hits in a much more deeper way. And quite honestly, I just really recommend it. I want to go and have an entire expanded uh, conversation about this and talk more and more on it but I'm gonna try to truncate it for this little media vlog that I'm doing so here I go let's see if I can do it I was absolutely floored by how incredible everything everywhere all at once was I made it a mission of mine to watch this no matter what it would take and after driving three hours for the nearest showing I was able to watch one of the very late showtimes Listen, the superhero film genre is making it very difficult for other films to prosper in the modern era, and I would sacrifice a million Spider-Man films for a few months of theaters being free of the MCU. Despite feeling exhausted, everything everywhere was still able to emotionally resonate with me on such a level that I wasn't prepared for. The themes of generational healing and disappointment of unfulfilled dreams were weaved so incredibly well with an absurdist trip into a film that uses the multiverse concept to tell a story that almost anyone can relate to. I laughed, I cried, I pondered how different my life would be if I had hot dogs for fingers. As of now, my movie of the year, and I implore you to watch this now that it is on streaming. I'm going to give this a 5 out of 5 as well. Everything Everywhere All at Once is going to be one of those films that I just can't get enough of, from its entire themes on generational healing and lost potential and just consistently thinking on what life could have been it resonates so strongly with me and i just couldn't help myself but enjoy it from its entire gut busting laughs to the moments where it had me in tears it's a film that i could easily recommend right now to anybody and quite honestly if you're looking for a film that you haven't necessarily seen, and you haven't necessarily seen everything everywhere all at once, why not give it a chance? And it's currently streaming, and I believe the Blu-ray is already out. So yeah, go and check it out if you can. I highly recommend it. Preferably watch that after this video, of course. I, uh, I would uh, preferably like you to do that, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, having said that, um, I'm sort of done talking about movies I really wanted to talk about, which means I guess I can necessarily move on to TV shows. Um, the one I really wanted to talk about first is uh, Channel Zero, which is streaming on Shudder. 
Um, it's very good. And uh, I guess if I can necessarily say anything about it, it's a bit older. But hey, if I haven't seen it, it's new to me. Um, also, considering the source material, I'm really impressed with how damn good this entire TV show is. Um, I want to go on and explain a little bit more about it, so uh, let's do that, shall we? Channel Zero has been an incredible discovery for me. Based on internet creepypastas, Channel Zero takes the most notable stories and refines them into six episode seasons that build an incredible mood as well as some phenomenal tension. I currently have finished the first season, Candle Cove, and strongly recommend the show with how amazing the plot adapts a short interesting concept into a full-fledged horror story. Based around disappearing kids, a town with more secrets than answers, and an ominous TV show that only children seem to be able to watch. While these concepts could be extremely cliched, the story's execution is so confident in its direction that I couldn't help but be enthralled. If you are even remotely interested or looking for a very unique horror show, Channel Zero is currently streaming on Shudder and well worth checking out. I'm giving it a 5 out of 5. I am a bit disappointed by how long it took me to actually check out Channel Zero just because of how incredible it ended up turning out to be. I think the entire premise felt like it was a too good to be true sort of circumstance, but it ended up coming out very well. And the first season is absolutely phenomenal. And as I'm about to finish up the second season, I'm very impressed. Uh, do get a Shutter account. There's actually a lot of good stuff. And quite honestly, it's not all that much in terms of subscription fee. Yeah, very good show, very worth your time, and do check it out if you're looking for a very good goddamn horror show to sink your teeth into. At least, I believe so. Okay, so having said that, um, I'm really excited about this next show, which is streaming on HBO Max, and I do believe it is called Harry. Wait, no, it's... I had been wanting to make that joke ever since I saw the first few episodes of Barry, and I'm very glad I got to finally make that joke now. So, yay for me. Um, what can I honestly say about Barry that hasn't been said? It's a very good goddamn show, and I guess the only other thing that can be said is that uh, Bill Hader plays a phenomenal role of a tall, weird-looking dude who just might end up killing you in your sleep, and I guess I want to discuss a little bit about that. So. Here we go. I started watching Barry as a means to pass the time till the third season of The Boys came out, and I am very glad I did. Bill Hader plays Barry Berkman, a former Marine turned hitman who begins to fill his life drifting toward mundanity and depression, whereupon a chance hit comes to him and leads to Barry trying to become a struggling actor. The show dives headfirst into a sea of moral grey as if it were Scrooge McDuck in a money pit, and jokes aside, Bill Hader plays the role of Barry with such compelling gravitas that it would be very easy to put this show in the same region as a Breaking Bad or Sopranos, with charismatic and compelling anti-heroes that are interesting to dissect and break down. However, Barry differentiates itself by having some amazing dark humor that gave me some pretty good belly laughs, and I can't wait for season 4, even though I have no idea how the show can continue. Also, Noho Hank is one of the best characters, and I'm giving the show a 5 out of 5. I'm really glad I gave Barry a chance, and watched it all the way through, and I am very excited for season 4, even though uh, I don't have any idea what you could necessarily do for a fourth season, especially with where it has essentially left off. But I guess we'll just end up going along with whatever ride they end up taking us, because hot damn this has been a good show. And I have just been completely sold on whatever happens. So excited for that. And speaking of shows that were on break, so that gave me a chance to watch Barry, I guess I can talk about The Boys, which I have been enjoying a lot. And while I don't necessarily enjoy the entire trope of evil superheroes because I feel it is a bit outplayed and has run its course to some degree, The Boys has done enough with it that I think it is phenomenal and it has renewed my entire faith that you can still write superheroes that are awful, demented human beings 
yet still has a really good fresh take on it. So uh, I want to dive into that a little bit here. So let's let's go. I get that it's hard not to enjoy the idea of a contorted image of superheroes. However, said image needs the right perspective. It's part of the reason I am always a bit critical of Zack Snyder due to the inability to understand that evil Superman isn't just overdone and played out, it's also a betrayal of the core principles of the Big Blue Boy Scout. This is also why The Boys, adapted from Garth Ennis' comic, succeeds though. Ennis' dislike of heroes is given a grounded scenario in which anxiety and paranoia of real life superheroes would constantly be floating through the air like a fart in church, and it is captured extremely well in the show. Every instance of Anthony Starr appearing on screen as Homelander is enough to keep a few hairs on the back of your neck raised. If you're getting worn out by the constant barrage of MCU films, as well as Snyder's constant lack of self-awareness with his superhero adaptations, do I have a show for you. I'm giving the show a 4.5 out of 5, as I do think some of the entire humor can be a bit edgy with its entire blood and core, but other than that, I think this show is incredible. I have a lot of problems with so much evil superhero content. I played Injustice, I've sat through the Zack Snyder films, I just am tired of all the different evil Superman comics that I've essentially seen, and it has really run its course for me. And while it could be very easy to file the boys in that entire subsection I think what helps it is that, yes, it is Garth Ennis, but also it's not completely falling right back into Evil Superman, but rather an entirely different area, which is Evil Superman as created by Walmart, in a sense. I guess Evil Superman created by Amazon, which is ironic considering this show is being streamed on Amazon Prime, uh, which, you know... If you have Amazon Prime, you can on obviously watch it. But having said that, I really do love The Boys, even though some of its edgier frames can be a little bit much, but it works for the most part. Uh, I highly recommend it, and go and check it out if you can. But do be warned, there is a lot of horrifying stuff that happens. But hey, I enjoy it. Give it a look. So I have my cat right here on my lap, and I am giving him pets. And uh, if it seems like I'm a little bit staggered in places with my talking, it's because I have a cat that is very comfy and is probably looking to claw into my leg. But we'll see what that ends up when that ends up happening. Right now, he's very comfy and he's enjoying himself. Um, but hey, I want to talk about the next show. So. I want to talk about AEW and New Japan Presents, Forbidden Door, as well as talking a little bit about Blood and Guts. Professional wrestling has always been something I'm very intrigued about, um, especially anything that isn't necessarily WWE, uh, just because I think that there's been this really interesting meta narrative about what professional wrestling can be uh, outside of WWE, of course. But there's something so interesting with how AEW and New Japan have a been able to work these two different rosters into this one gigantic show that had so much in terms of quality in matches and storylines, especially one specific match I want to necessarily highlight, which is, of course, the Will Ospreay versus Orange Cassidy match. And... I guess I can go a little bit more into detail right now, so I'm going to do that. So, here we go. I have been a huge pro wrestling fan since I was a kid, and while WWE has consistently forced my interest to wane with questionable choices and declining quality for years, AEW and New Japan have definitely been able to reignite that interest for me. That's why when a proposed crossover show, which would essentially have AEW and New Japan wrestlers facing off and joining forces in their respective matches, I was immediately on board. The road to Forbidden Door wasn't a perfect one though, as a number of pro wrestlers on both rosters started to get injured as if there was a contest to see who could force the card to change more dramatically, and the top wrestlers on each winked at the camera and muttered, watch this. Ryan Danielson, CM Punk, Hiromu Takahashi, and Tomohiro Ishii are just to name a few. 
However, even with some of the biggest stars getting injured, Forbidden Door was an incredible show with almost every match being somewhere between great and perfect. A special recommendation though has to go to the Will Ospreay vs Orange Cassidy match for the IWGP US title. Orange Cassidy is incredible at deconstructing every pro wrestler whose gimmick seems to be that they take themselves too seriously, and as such, was the perfect foil for someone who takes themselves as seriously as Will Ospreay. As a result, I have to give this entire pay-per-view a 4 out of 5, and as well as adding to this, I really enjoyed AEW Blood and Guts, and I would probably give that one a 4 out of 5 as well. AEW and New Japan have both been exemplary in everything that they have done as of late, especially with how they have been able to deal with shortcomings such as injuries and the entire COVID era. Uh, COVID era. But I think what really helps them is just their entire ability to really promote all their stars and make them feel like huge deals. A far cry from WWE's entire idea of just making their brands feel important and nobody else but their biggest star at the moment, which feels a little bit old at this point and a little frustrating to say the least. But that's why I love AEW and New Japan. They really do cater to people who actively put the time and effort into watching their shows. And as a result, it all pays off. And it's one of the reasons why I absolutely am a fan. And I hope more people give professional wrestling a chance because AEW has been great and New Japan has been very solid. And currently New Japan is going through their G1 Climax tournament, which if I had to say anything, it is the best professional wrestling tournament of all time. And I really do hope that we get a lot of really good matches uh, out of the entire show. I'm almost 100% positive we're probably going to get a few. So that's always something to look forward to. If I do say so myself. So talking about this, this is a bit of an older thing to be talking about. Uh, it's Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments. Um, this entire listicle is actually really special to me because this is actually how I got into a lot of different horror genre and a lot of different horror uh, media in general. Uh, a lot of different series such as like Evil Dead and a lot of different movies like Audition and also some off, uh, off the rails um, and off the beaten path uh, films such as like Near Dark and much more. And um, this entire special I think uh, is really important to me because it was also uh, something I saw as a sort of like, as a sort of pick me up from when I broke my foot in, uh, I think I was, yeah, I believe it was around eighth, seventh or eighth grade. And, uh, I was about 13 at the time. So instead of going out and hanging out with friends and such, I had to stay home. And all I had was either playing Silent Hill three again, or, uh, watching this. And as I got more into it, I was actively getting really interested in all of these different horror films that were showing at the time so i was really interested and this is why i want to sort of talk to it uh talk about it because uh you can find it on youtube and i think even more interesting than that um you can just sit down and just find so much interesting stuff uh so many interesting tidbits about it so uh having said that I want to sort of give more of an understanding as to why I absolutely adore this entire list. And, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's just get into it. I love horror, and this special definitely spurred that interest in many ways. While the worst part of this is the dated comedy with plenty of B and C list comedians doing bad impressions of the scenes being talked about, I have to say I enjoy everything else about this near four hour special. There are plenty of interviews with so much horror royalty, with the likes of John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, Dario Argento, and so many more. It's fascinating to watch as you get to see so many people within this genre give their opinions and thoughts on so many different films. It helps to give so many of the horror films listed a chance to have reference, especially films that were either made before I was born, such as Near Dark and Black Sunday, or movies that were extremely obscure to me at the time, like Old Boy or Audition. As a result, I still enjoy coming back to the special to reference more horror films that I may enjoy watching. 
There were two follow-up specials, although I consider them not as good due to being very light on film selections and reduced input from the horror royalty, although there is plenty of Eli Roth to go around if you enjoy input from the guy who made Green Inferno. I would rate this entire special a 4.5 out of 5, and definitely get a chance to look at it if you can. Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments is definitely dated, I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot of different comedy and humor that lands like a wet fart in church, but I still enjoy it. It definitely gives me a lot of an understanding as to where horror was at the time, while also still getting to revisit different films that I haven't necessarily got a chance to uh, check out as of late. Um, I'm currently going to try and watch Duel uh, sometime soon, and I am really interested in checking out Blood Simple as well. And hell, if not for this entire list, I would have never learned about Near Dark or Audition or Old Boy. Although I think I would have eventually found out about Old Boy, but hey, this was the thing that eventually got me to check out the Evil Dead series. So really, I think this is a really cool list to still look into and check. So if you're looking for something to look at and try and expand your entire horror movie uh, watch list, why not give this entire thing a go and set aside maybe four hours? You can definitely just watch about an hour a piece or even just go at your own pace. I at least recommend that. Okay, now this is going to lead to the next show I and I was going to talk about. And uh, it's streaming on Netflix. I think we all know what it is. Stranger Things Season 4. I've definitely watched it. And as a recording, it's still pretty fresh. Season 4 has just ended. And I don't necessarily want to spoil too much, so I'm going to give my general thoughts very quickly and also give a little bit of a score as to how I thought about it before I go into a bit more spoilers. I don't want to necessarily like be that kind of guy. However, I will put a time code as to where to skip to to make sure you don't necessarily get spoiled. So having said that, let's get into my beginning general thoughts and let's see what I ended up thinking about it. I liked Season 4 more than Seasons 2 and 3, although Season 1 is still the best out of everything. Season 1 is still incredible due in part to how unique it was at the time, and how much it felt like an elongated emblem film. Season 2 feels extremely lopsided and incredibly hard to get through at times because of the meandering plot, while Season 3 unfortunately suffers the curse of nostalgia and misreadings as the show becomes more 80 centric. Having said that, Season 4 feels very horror adjacent with some fantastic visuals and a villain that gives a sense of race stakes, although I feel a bit underwhelmed by said villain due to my own personal intrigue. Also some of the plot feels plotting at times, although that just seems par for the course for the show at this point. Overall I'm going to give this show a 3.5 out of 5. Okay so having said that, um, I'm gonna need you to skip to this time code uh, on the screen. I don't necessarily want to spoil this show because I know it's still somewhat fresh, even though it's been out for a couple of weeks, you've probably already seen it. Or if you're necessarily catching up, hey, this is the perfect time to not necessarily uh, see this and just skip to another part. Um, but having said that, please skip uh, this entire segment. Uh, I don't want to necessarily be an asshole and uh, spoil this entire show because I'm, I'm going to spoil this show like a uh, carton of milk. Uh, so, yeah, skip, and having said that, um, you've been warned, um, let's get into it. Season 4 of Stranger Things feels like it built up of so many things pertaining to all the past seasons. Relationships, the upside down, and the overall danger that all the characters end up finding themselves in. That's why I was pleasantly surprised by all the new characters that were inserted into the show. Eddie and Argyle legitimately felt like great additions that didn't have me wanting them to be Judy Winslow, with Eddie Munson giving some fantastic emotional beats to the show all the way up to his death. Yes, yeah, Stranger Things carries on its season tradition of introducing a likeable fan favorite only for them to die by the end of the season. You have to imagine at this point there is a secret deity that Duffer's angered and can only be appeased by killing incredibly specific characters in their TV shows. Eddie's death did catch me off guard somewhat. Although I'd like to imagine an incredibly specific scenario where Eddie Munson didn't die and lived to 2003 
where he got to experience Metallica's Saint Anger and wishing he did die as a result. Having gone down this incredibly long tangent, certain parts of the plot definitely drag as well as character motivations being very off. The Russian and Californian subplots feel extremely disconnected at times from the main story, with the Russian subplot especially having me scratching my head at times. Joyce Byers leaving her children on a hunch without so much as a hint as to her true intent feels incredibly awkward and as I am referencing the plot to save Hopper, this show has a real problem with not allowing anything to breathe. Before the season even ended, a fifth season was announced which immediately piqued my suspicion that a good majority of the main cast would survive. This definitely let off a lot of tension and had me a bit frustrated. And on a personal note, as much as I like Vecna's design, Stranger Things unfortunately has the same problem that Silent Hill has with its source of evil. Horror has a saying that you should never show the devil's face, an unwritten rule that you should never make your monster something tangible enough to comprehend. With Vecna and the origin of the Offset Down being revealed, I couldn't help but be a bit let down. The otherworldly atmosphere being unraveled to reveal a man with the same powers as Eleven just undermined so much mystery and sort of took away my suspension of disbelief somewhat. Hopefully so season 5 can rekindle that sense of mystery somewhat because season 4 unfortunately breaks each portions of it. If I had to give this entire show a rating, as I said before, it would be a 3.5 out of 5. I just really wish that that mystery wouldn't necessarily be revealed at least until the end, or at least give me something a little bit more enjoyable to sink my teeth into. I definitely have a few hang-ups uh, about Season 4 of Stranger Things. There are a few minor tidbits that have always kept me from it fully enjoying it, but it's mainly, I think that it's just some of the quality that unfortunately always ends up dropping a little bit season by season. However, I think that season two is definitely the worst it ever got. And I think it was able to pull itself up by season three and season four was definitely its best season since season one. Although I still think that season one is the best season four had a lot of stuff. I really liked a really good horror adjacent plot. Uh, really good monster design and just numerous other things it was just a few little tidbits that sort of pulled away from it. all of it i still like stranger things and i think i can recommend it uh, the characters are very strong and i do like to see how their entire plot ends up going about and i do like the arcs that each character have so that's always something i can necessarily recommend however Sometimes the plot can be a little bit meandering. Uh, it's just the way that Stranger Things ends up being at this point. It's never necessarily been able to shake that entire feeling of what are we doing? Let's just get on with it. But having said that, I still enjoy it. I still like it for the most part. And I can still recommend it. Mostly. Mileage may vary. Okay, having said that, I think we're done talking about the TV shows I wanted to talk about, so I guess we can now move into the video games that I play, which I'm really excited to talk about because I've been playing a few games uh, that I've been really enjoying, uh, specifically one that I came back to, which I actually played on stream, and that's Enemy Zero, which was released on the Sega Saturn and was released uh, to... Uh, fairly decent reviews however it was developed by Kenji Eno and uh, I believe it was made by Warp Games and the reason why I want to talk about Enemy Zero is because it is the second game in a trilogy the Digital Actress Laura trilogy which has uh, the first game D which I played a lot as a child D was a point and click horror adventure game that had a lot of really good setup and a lot of really good interesting plot developments about it that I really really do love about just how Kenji Anno tells his stories and that leads me into why I want to talk about uh, Enemy Zero because I think this game's entire uh, shoot for the stars attitude is just incredible it has a few problems I'm not gonna lie but Enemy Zero might be one of the most intriguing games I've ever played and it's why I want to talk about it.
The second game in Kenji Eno's Digital Actress Lore Trilogy, Enemy Zero is an incredibly unique horror sci-fi game that depending on your mileage for difficulty will either be extremely intriguing or absolutely frustrating. Enemy Zero tells the story of Laura Lewis being trapped aboard a spacecraft with invisible aliens, which leads to the crux of the gameplay loop. If an alien gets too close to you, you die in one hit. However, Laura can find a firearm and kill these aliens in one hit as well, but there are asterisks to this entire action. Your gun has to be charged every time it is fired and only has an effective range of about a meter. This leads to some of the most amazing tension I have ever experienced in a video game, although one section near the end had me actively wanting to lose my mind, especially since Enemy Zero has limited continues and saves, and once you run out of both of them, you have to restart the entire game. Although the game is only about 5 hours long, so that isn't necessarily too much trouble. That being said, I have never felt more validated than when I solved a puzzle with my own personal understanding of binary and completed this game. If you love surreal sci-fi horror and 90s CG aesthetics with very unique gameplay, then this might be a game worth trying to find. Also, it's worth mentioning that D is on GOG for pretty cheap and worth checking out as well. I'm going to give Enemy Zero a 4 out of 5. Enemy Zero is a game that has so much charm, and while it does have some setbacks, I just can't help but enjoy it. It's a game that actively wears its entire jank on its sleeve, but it also wears its difficulty, all of its amazing presentation, everything that I could legitimately recommend on its sleeve as well. It's great, it's worth a check, the music is phenomenal, as I said before, and ju there's just so much here that I could honestly just consistently gush about. Enemy Zero is a little bit hard to find, and I do really recommend trying to figure out a few different ways to play it before you end up splurging on a Sega Saturn and a copy of Enemy Zero, but if you are able to get it, or if you are able to play it, I highly recommend playing it in the dark. It is it is an experience, and one that I cannot recommend enough. The next game I wanted to actually talk about is Wild Arms 3, which you can actually get on the PS2 and on the PS4. Um, it got a digital release, thankfully, so you can actually go and grab this right now if you want to, so long as you have a PS2 uh, or a PS4. That being said, I really wanted to talk about this because... JRPGs were a dime a dozen on the PS2. Maybe you were somebody who liked Square Enix, and so you ended up getting Final Fantasy, or you had Kingdom Hearts, or you were an Atlas fan, so you ended up really liking SMT Nocturne, or you were playing Persona 4 and arguing whether or not Chie was best girl. But for me, I really liked Wild Arms 3, and I think it had such an interesting presentation, and it had such a really interesting um, setting that I just ended up falling in love with it. So I think it's enough to necessarily make it into this overview, but also I've just been really enjoying going back to it and just playing the beginning again. So I wanted to talk about it just because I'm having fun and it's, it's neat. Wild Arms 3 might be one of my favorite underrated JRPGs of the PS2 era. And it's so fascinating because it does have a digital version on the PS4 for purchase. I don't see too many talking about Wild Arms 3 though, and as a result, I always feel a bit curious how this game still gets enough groundswell for digital release. The story of Wild Arms 3 is a hefty 40 to 6 hours to complete, mixing the likes of mysticism and magic with bullets and bandoliers to create a massive JRPG that allows the plot to always have a new intrigue. There are a few genre tropes here and there that do tend to overstay their welcome, such as random battles and grinding, however Wild Arms 3 does try to remedy this. While exploring the overworld or a dungeon, you get an encounter gauge that will allow you to skip a certain amount of battles until it is empty. If you have enough gauge or strong enough to make the battle inadequate, you can just skip the encounters which is an incredible change of pace that I fully welcome. Overall, I would say if you are looking for a JRPG to sink an unhealthy amount of time into, why not give Wild Arms 3 a chance? I'm giving it a 4 out of 5. Wild Arms 3 isn't necessarily the best game ever. It's not in my top 10 games of all time. It might be in my top 10 JRPGs, but... 
having said that, it's still pretty decent. It still has some merit, and I think that it's a lot of fun. The characters are great. The enemies are very fun. I really do like the gangs that you end up facing off against. If I had to really recommend this and sort of describe it, very straightforward. It feels like a 2004 mid-aughts anime, sort of, that just has that cozy feeling of nostalgia. I can recommend it very easily. It's essentially like a Trigun of sorts, especially with its entire Wild West setting. Look for this game, and it's pretty easy to find, considering it is on the digital store for the PS4. Having said, if you still have your PS4, I know some people are selling them already for the PS5. However, I know it's also becoming a little bit difficult to find a PS4 as well. So uh, if you still have your PS4, definitely give it a check if you like JRPGs. So one of the things I actually wanted to say before uh, prefacing this or saying anything uh, further was that I was always more of a Digimon kid as opposed to Pokemon. So... I've been going back and playing Digimon World, and I've been enjoying myself. Um, it's definitely a lot more uh, complicated whenever you're playing through, just because there's a lot more attributes that you have to necessarily take care of. Uh, making sure your Digimon is fed, making sure it's not shitting itself. Uh, literally, it will shit itself if you don't necessarily take care of it, making sure it doesn't get sick, making sure if it does get sick, you go and take it to a doctor, and just so many other different attributes. And I think that's a lot of the reason why I sort of enjoy it. But one of the main, uh, one of the more main reasons why I actually like Digimon World is mainly because when you go through it, you're essentially going through this entire world that feels very lived in. And I want to necessarily touch a little bit more on that. So I guess... I want to give a little bit of an overview as to why I've been playing it as of late. Digimon World isn't a gotta catch em all game in a conventional sense. No, it's actually a monster raising simulator as well as a monster battling RPG. You might be saying that this is just Pokemon, but does Pokemon force you to feed your Pokemon, take it to the bathroom so it doesn't soil itself, make sure it doesn't get injured or sick, take it to the doctor when it does get sick, Tell it to go to bed and endure its death so it can be reincarnated and you can do it all over again? Yeah, I didn't think so. The system of raising your Digimon is complex as it feeds into your Digimon's ability to battle, evolve, and get stronger. As your Digimon gets stronger, your ability to explore the world, File Island, expands with File Island actually having some of the best PS1 environments I've ever seen. Everything feels very lived in and the numerous feral Digimon help to make this entire world feel very alive. The story isn't too interesting, you and your Digimon are tasked with convincing certain Digimon to come live in File City, whether that be by battling them, playing mini games with them, feeding them, or other various activities. It can be a bit tedious, but convincing more Digimon to live in File City means more of the island begins to become accessible, and it leads to getting to see more of the environments which, as I said, have amazing sights. Gear Savannah is a personal favorite. If you're a bit burnt out by usual Pokemon fare and want a bit of a challenge, why not give Digimon World a try? And I'm giving this a 3.5 out of 5, as well as a special recommendation for Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, as I do believe that game is also really good, although I would give that game a 4 out of 5, as it is a little bit more complete and easier for new players and beginners. Digimon World is very loose on its conveyance. It's a little bit hard to really figure out what the hell is going on when you first play it, but as you start to pick things up, as you start to get into it, it really does start to blend into this really beautiful experience of exploration and raising your Digimon and feeling like things are starting to pay off. What really got me to wanting to come back to it was I saw somebody on Twitter make the statement of, Digimon World is the Dark Souls of video games, and while I am sick and tired of that phrase of X is the Dark Souls of X, I still really think that Digimon World sort of lives up to that entire merit. There's a lot of things that you sort of had to figure it out on yourself, but once you start to figure it out and you get a little bit of a tip and an idea of what to do from other people and how they play, I think you start to really understand what lies at the core of Digimon World. 
a game in which you are a little explorer trying to make sure that your Digimon doesn't die, as well as making sure it doesn't shit itself. Truly a memorable experience that you will carry on for the rest of your life. So, I have been playing a Silent Hill, and it is Silent Hill 4 for the PS2. Finally revealed it. And I came back to it um, just because I've been enjoying just how off the entire uh, main path that this game is. Uh, I said earlier that I don't necessarily like the core uh, evil source of Silent Hill, mainly because it is just an evil religion, which means it's tangible to some extent. And I always felt like the... The core appeal of Silent Hill is that it's evil always felt broad in its scope and you could never necessarily just like narrow it down to just one source and that's why I sort of don't necessarily like Silent Hill 1 or 3. I always feel like that's just sort of like very constricting in terms of like its entire idea of horror and that's why I really adore Silent Hill 2 to the point in where it is my favorite survival horror game and that's why I love Silent Hill 4 as well and i actually like it enough to make it my third favorite silent hill in front of the original and while that might necessarily make me a philistine i have reason for that and i'm gonna go into that right now the cult of silent hill feels very limiting and as a result completely dissipates a lot of the ambiguity behind the evil force that dwells in this quiet abandoned lakeside town that's why i love silent hill 2 and enjoy silent hill 4 even more than the original Silent Hill? I know that is a bit sacrilegious to say, and some might be ready to call me a filthy philistine in the comments, but Silent Hill 4's biggest issue is mainly only its combat. Everything else is incredible to me. Silent Hill 4's soundtrack is incredible, with a dark and somber tone, with the theme Room of Angel embodying a sinister vengeful emotion drenched in sorrow, which perfectly mirrors the narrative of Silent Hill 4. Speaking of narrative, Silent Hill 4 gets to be a standalone story that barely has anything to actually do with Silent Hill. In fact, it doesn't even take place in Silent Hill at all. What makes this so appealing as a result is that it means the story gets to be laser focused on its own plot, which if I had to describe it would probably be a mix of Jacob's Ladder, Exorcist 3, and 7. A supernatural killer is taking the lives of people, and it is up to the main character, Henry, to uncover the mystery behind the killer. Henry isn't a very compelling main character, but diving deeper into the horror of the supernatural murders is what keeps bringing me back to this game. The horror of these murders occurring and the spirits coming back to haunt you as eventual spirits is great, albeit it does feel like a diet version of Fatal Frame. Nevertheless, I love supernatural horror and an unorthodox plot, and Silent Hill 4 is nestled somewhat well between those two concepts. Combat is pretty terrible though, as a result I have to give this a 4 out of 5. Also, the last third of this entire game is a escort mission and a pretty awful one at that. So yeah, that also sort sucks. Silent Hill 4 isn't my favorite Silent Hill game, that honor goes to Silent Hill 2. But I still believe that Silent Hill 4 is my third favorite game. Right in front of Silent Hill 1, and I know that a lot of people out there are already getting their pitchforks and torches, uh, but I can't help it. I, I adore what Silent Hill 4 is trying to do, from the fact that it is essentially trying to take the entire plot of Silent Hill 1, 3, and 2, and essentially try and make something else out of it with its own isolated story. It isn't even taking place in Silent Hill, and that's makes it even more interesting, is that Silent Hill 4 isn't trying to be Silent Hill 1 and 3. It's trying to be tidbits of The Exorcist 3 and Jacob's Ladder as well as 7, leading to this really interesting supernatural murder mystery that has this mood of sorrow and pain and tragedy. It's... A really interesting romp into the dark recesses of a killer's mind as he begins to stalk you and the people around you. I adore this game, and I think it really does deserve a sort of 
reevaluation of sorts. Silent Hill 4 isn't necessarily the best Silent Hill game, but it is definitely one of the better ones, and I do recommend it. It's still pretty cheap online, and you can find it for pretty easy money, uh, as well as finding a PS2 isn't necessarily too hard. There's millions of them out there. I'm sure you'll be able to find one pretty pretty easy as well. So, yeah. Definitely try and give this game another look and see what you end up finding. So I know I said I had bought House of the Dead Remake and how that was a bad game. Uh, I had also bought another bad game recently and I played it on stream, which was Resident Evil Survivor for the PlayStation 1. And it's a bad game. The voice acting is bad. The plot is razor thin and nothing special. The frame rate chugs whenever there's like three or four zombies on screen. And so it all comes to a screeching slow stop of like 10 to 15 frames per second. It makes me feel like my PlayStation 2 is going to explode at any second. Um, and the Lycan support that was supposed to be in this game got pulled which is just disappointing, but considering the events that made this entire uh, support be pulled, um, I, I understand. I, I completely understand. But nevertheless, it ends up making this one of the worst Resident Evil games um, right up there with Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City and your uh, Umbrella Corps. But having said that, I think what really brought me back to it is that it's a guilty pleasure it is like a bag of potato chips it's not very filling it's sort of bad for me but it's very easy to just digest and i can just go through it in one sitting and honestly that's fine that's all i need at the moment so i guess i can go into a little bit more detail about why i'm fine with having resident evil survivor so let's go i guess the voice acting is so bad that it's good the opening sequence is up there with jax's ending in mk4 for hilariously bad voice acting every cutscene is a magnum opus of awful dialogue and i enjoyed all of it the story is razor thin though and your usual fare Umbrella does experiments, infects the local area, zombies become the new residents of evil, and looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. The story is incredibly inconsequential, but is also so relatively short that you can essentially beat the game in about 2-3 to three hours, with a full completionless playthrough being about 5-6 to six hours to accomplish. Lastly, gameplay, which I do have to admit is pretty rotten. Headshots no longer create head explosions, which is a huge bummer. A Resident Evil game without head explosions is like watching Goodfellas with all the swearing bleeped out. Sure, you get the general idea of the source material, but you can't help but feel like certain materials are missing. Also, first person shooting just doesn't lend itself as well as the usual fare of the RE third person tank controls. Aiming is slow and clumsy with turning and aiming being separate from one another. This is all a bit unforgivable. However. This does lead to running being your best option and creates a better way to play RE Survivor. How long can you go without engaging enemies? Trying to circumvent enemies by dodging makes every encounter have a bit more tension as you get spun towards zombies whenever you take damage and more agile enemies can make maneuvering more challenging. This is the core of Resident Evil Survivor. Baby's first speedrun game of a Resident Evil title. An absurdly bad game to some, but the video game equivalent to junk food. Cheap, fast, and probably bad for you, but hits the spot in a pinch where you don't feel like dedicating all your time to a full game. I still have to give this game a 2.5 out of 5, however, I would give it a 3.5 out of 5 if you're just looking for something really short, easy, and non-consequential to your entire day. I like it enough. Resident Evil Survivor is a bad game. There's no denying it. There are countless reviews out there that will tell you that this game sucks. And quite honestly, I can't necessarily even argue that. 
But what I can argue is that within its own little minute area, I still enjoy it. And yeah, it's awful. It's bad. And the gameplay is very, very boring if you're playing it straightforward. If you're looking to speedrun it, it's not even that hard to get right back into. It's a short game, and that's sort of why I enjoy it. It's short. It's easy to just figure out what you're supposed to do. There's not really too much that's going to set you back if you end up losing. And quite honestly, I don't mind it. It is bad, but I enjoy playing something bad in the same way that I enjoy bad films to some extent. Like The Room or something along the lines of Birdemic. And that's sort of what Resident Evil Survivor is. A Birdemic. A... A video game version of the room. It's not bad to such a degree that I could necessarily recommend going out and buying this. The price is actually very high. But if you're somebody like me who likes bad media and can enjoy how bad it is to the point that it's good, that you are a Resident Evil fan and that you do like survival horror. Maybe pick up Resident Evil Survivor? I can't necessarily fully recommend it, but if you're out there and you're looking to try and pick it up, be my guest. And I think that's going to do it. Um, thank you for watching this. I know I had a lot of stumbles and fumbles on my own words, but I hope you sort of get the idea of what I was going for here and what I was talking about. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you go and check out some of the stuff I talked about, or if you already have, maybe leave me a comment or two about what you thought about some of the stuff I, I've uh, watched, and maybe you didn't enjoy some of the stuff I enjoy, maybe you don't. That's fine though. I hope you did enjoy this video because, quite honestly, i really been wanting to do this for a while, and I really do hope that some people like end up enjoying something here, because... Um, like I said, I'm just trying to make some stuff that y'all people will enjoy, and doing this media vlog was a lot of fun. It was a little bit frustrating because I did have cats jumping around the place here and there, but uh, Spaghetti has definitely calmed down <laughs> after uh, enjoying a little bit of a nap, and Bean is also napping uh, somewhere around my apartment, so yeah. Uh, I hope y'all enjoyed. I've been obsolete Borger. Uh, I will see y'all in the next video, and I hope y'all are doing well, stay safe, and I'll see y'all later. Adios.